Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker. Play the Opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the Opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. Let's turn to the spectacle at a House hearing this morning. Uh, Republicans and Democrats were gathered there to mark up a proposal to hold Hunter Biden in contempt of Congress for defying a subpoena for him to sit for an interview. And lo and behold, who should show up at the hearing but Hunter Biden? Let's listen to Republican Congresswoman Nancy Mace at the Oversight Committee hearing. You are the epitome of white privilege coming into the Oversight Committee, spitting in our face, ignoring a congressional subpoena to be deposed. What are you afraid of? If the lady If the gentle lady wants to hear from Hunter Biden, we can hear from him right now, Mr. Chairman. Let's take a vote and hear from Hunter Biden. What are you afraid of? Hold on, hold on. Kim, what do you make of this? Is just just a uh, a wild PR strategy on behalf of of Hunter and his attorneys? Absolutely, it was a total stunt. If you go back and remember what we were dealing with here, the House Oversight Committee and the House Judiciary Committee issued subpoenas to Hunter all the way back in November, saying you need to come in and give a deposition in front of our committees. And you know, anyone who knows how these things work, these things are very in-depth. They're usually conducted by staff attorneys. The person who's been subpoenaed has their lawyers with them. A lot of time and effort has gone into the questions, how much time for each side, everything. Hunter doesn't want to do this. He wants to come in and turn this into a a public hearing where he can pound his fist on the table and, and, you know, make his political points rather than answering the kind of very in-depth granular questions that the committee is seeking. So he refused to come to his hearing. They have now threatened contempt. And here he goes again. He shows up with the lawyers unexpected. And clearly that was designed to evoke exactly the response you got there from Democrats saying, look, you know, he's been saying all along he'll talk publicly to you. Why don't you just let him speak here right now? Well, of course, nobody was prepared. That was not what this hearing was about, marking up a resolution to deal with contempt. Nobody was prepared at that moment to do a hearing with Hunter Biden. They then quite stridently walked out the door when Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene went to talk. They have a a personal animus against her. And uh, Hunter Biden's lawyer gave another press statement out in the hallway and out they went. It's unclear what the purpose of this could have or would have been other than to, again, try to have a PR moment and again, try to suggest that it's Republicans that are in the wrong for not allowing Hunter to testify the way he wants to, rather than Hunter who's in the wrong for defying duly issued subpoenas. Let's listen to a piece of Hunter's attorney, Abby Lowell, making that argument outside the hearing room. Last fall, Chairman Comer made an explicit offer that people like Hunter and had, like him, the option to attend a deposition or a public hearing, whichever they chose. Hunter chose a hearing where Republicans could not distort, manipulate, or misuse that testimony. Honoring and then ignoring that invitation and proving once again that they cared little about the truth and wanted only to, quote, move the needle of political support, which was a quote Chairman Comer confessed was his true purpose. Bill, I don't know any other way to put that other than it. this looks like a PR strategy and maybe uh, Comer said that at some point that he would be happy to have Hunter in an open hearing, but also people uh, can change their strategies. And to the point that Kim's make, Hunter doesn't get to choose what forum he sits for this investigation in. It, it, it matters what's on the subpoena. First thing, it looks like Hunter wants to try his case in public with PR relations, and he's counting on the press to focus on Republicans and not go after him. And he's probably, that's probably a good bet. But I think that's because the legal case is so weak. My understanding is that Comer offered him the open hearing, but on the understanding that he would sit for a deposition first, which was exactly what the January 6th committee offered. Steve Bannon later offered to testify publicly, and they rejected it and held him in contempt. So I think I'm curious about Hunter's strategy, because 
His last strategy on the gun tax charges resulted in two felony counts being revived against him. I don't see the outcome on this because if the House goes through and holds him in contempt, then the Biden Justice Department refuses to prosecute. I think you have a a clear storyline about favoritism toward the Biden family when Joe's running for re-election. And that comes on top of the whoppers he told about Hunter not getting money from China, the laptop being Russian disinformation. So I'm not sure what the goal is here. I think maybe he avoids prosecution, but I think he's going to really harm his father with these kind of stunts. Kim, we'll give you the last word, but picking up where Bill left off, it does seem to me that whatever people think of Hunter Biden and this investigation and the evidence that James Comer and others have presented in public so far, there's also, it seems to me, a matter of vindicating congressional subpoena power here. And Bill picked out two names. Uh, I mean, Steve Bannon was convicted of contempt of Congress in July of 2022 Navarro, another former Trump advisor, was also convicted of contempt of Congress in 2022. And if this referral goes through the House, then it ends up at the Justice Department's door and raises some difficult questions for Attorney General Merrick Garland and the U.S. attorneys of whether and how how vigorously they are going to pursue that, that effort of the opposition party in the House to vindicate their subpoena and get an interview with the president's son. Yeah, I agree that this is important as an a vindication of the authority of congressional subpoena. And I agree that this needs to put a big spotlight on Merrick Garland's Justice Department to see whether it now engages in unequal justice or treatment under the law in that the argument back when you were dealing with Bannon and others is that mere mortals are not allowed to thumb their nose at congressional subpoenas. and There should be consequences if you do not. It strikes me that Hunter is no different in that regard. He can claim all he wants that he's a victim of political targeting. But then again, those former Trump advisors made the same case that they were the victim of political targeting. And nonetheless, they were issued subpoenas. They didn't come and there were consequences. So this is going to be potentially a problem for the DOJ. I I remember hearing a number of Republicans say, well, I don't know, was it worthwhile doing the whole contempt procedure and sending it because DOJ may not act on it anyway? Well, if it goes to DOJ and Garland doesn't act, that's a bit of a scandal because step back and and see what that is saying. That This is Joe Biden's Department of Justice refusing to enforce uh, or take legal actions when a contempt resolution has been sent to it from Congress because the person involved happens to be the president's son. Thank you, Kim and Bill. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button. And we'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch.